us for this great gathering. I want to say to our guest of honor, this is our version of Saturday Night Live in Scranton. <laughs> and really draw a great crowd for a great occasion as we celebrate a wonderful landmark. I say Saturday Night Live because, well, I say it because I think State Representative Flynn and Bizarro are not here tonight. So I think from what I read in the New York Times, we're safe for the evening as I, I see it. It really is an amazing place to gather here. I just said to Father Quinn, this is the first time that I have been on the campus in several years, and uh, it just looks wonderful. Anywhere you look, it is such an extraordinary picture of a campus that uh, truly continues to draw people and will tomorrow for the great open house. But how about this as you gather here tonight in this room that uh, fits us all and, and makes us all happy to be here, the Father McElhaney Ballroom. And yes, it should. Not only is he here tonight, and not only is it an extraordinary year in his life, 70 years a member of the Society of Jesus, that's the real reason to applaud <laughs> Father McElhaney. But we're just down the hall from the Moskowitz Theater. And she's here as well. Anne is the president of the Friends of the Library, and one of the great reasons why this has thrived for all two decades. But as you know, her other half is a great reason for the existence of the Moskowitz Theater, Leo, or as we call him, St. Leo of the Valley, <laughs> will be 110 in December. He is an amazing soul. Anne said he was not really up to coming tonight, and I got concerned because she seemed to be suggesting that he was slowing down. She couldn't understand why. He's tired and she couldn't figure it out. And so I sheepishly said to her, Ann, um, how long since Leo's been out of the house? Oh, she said he goes down to Allied to the gym every day. <laughs> so I suspect we'll all be celebrating that birthday. My favorite story that I tell often in New York when they talk about long lives about Leo is when he celebrated his 108th I had the opportunity to be with him at Pat Sells, and I was to say something that night, and I asked Leo, they want me to say something nice about you, Leo. Tell me, what's the best part about being 108 years old? And I'll never forget his answer. He said, the best part? No peer pressure. <laughs> Which is pretty extraordinary when you think about it. You know, he calls Anne his trophy bride because she's so much younger. <laughs> and when I asked him what keeps him so young, he said, well, I take one vitamin a day. Imagine. That's the only medication at 109, one vitamin a day. And I said to him, Leo, could you tell me what kind of vitamin that is? I'd like to take that. <laughs> he said, the kind, uh, it's the Flintstones. <laughs> he said, we knew them. <laughs> So not only do we have representation of the name in the person of Father McElhaney, in the name of Ann Moskowitz, but also down the hall is the Frank McDonald Conference Room, and Mickey is here as well. So if I can ask Father McElhaney and Mickey and Ann, just stand, if you would, for a minute, because it's pretty amazing living history here in this room tonight. You know, it is their generosity that made so much possible here as it is with so many other things uh, in this university where we truly do look back to those who have made possible the dreams and visions that have been put forth over the years by so many different extraordinary leaders along the way. As I was driving up this afternoon from Fordham, I was thinking to myself, it is amazing. It is nearly 70 years since my own father finished from this university and launched his life. He would never say he's a dentist. He always called himself a smile adjuster. <laughs> and he and my mother would go on to have a family of 12, and all of the boys would come here to the university. And we all finished my oldest brother in the late 60s, and my brother Peter and I in the 70s, and then Andrew in the 80s. And the next generation, there's about a dozen of them who have either finished or are going through education here. And I'm happy to tell the president that there's another 36 beyond those of the next generation that we hope still will be applying to come to Scranton. But it is an amazing part of our lives, and I think that's why we love to come and celebrate just about anything. But to come and celebrate what this night is about is a special treat for all of us. And so when Sandra called me during the course of the summer, Sandra Myers, the 
chair of tonight's event, and we should thank Sandra. This is a great crowd, Sandra and her team, for what has happened here. She asked if I would serve as the MC, and any of you who know Sandra and have dealt with her over the years, no, you can't say no to Sandra, regardless of what it is. And if you doubt that, well, ask her husband of 58 years. He'll tell you. The remarkable Maury Myers, you can't say no to Sandra. And they keep saying yes to the University of Scranton, which is always extraordinary for us. But Sandra's always been right to the point. Anybody who knows her never beats around the bush. She goes right to the bottom line. I got an email the day after we spoke in July with these directions. And I will quote Sandra directly. She outlined the program, and then she said, bottom line, be funny be smart, be meaningful, and be pretty brief. <laughs> and so I will try my best, because I'll still have to deal with Sandra on the other side. But let me tell you how extraordinary honor it is to have our guest of honor here tonight, not only to help us mark the 20th anniversary of this great organization, but it is truly a speaker of note and distinction. When I knew from Sandra that the author of Transatlantic was coming here to Scranton, and I thought, I can make that trans-Pocono trip one more <laughs> time. It's not a problem. I'll go over the mountains. And so I started to research some things about him, and I came across these words, which I think resonate with everybody in this room. Colin was interviewed, and in the course of the interview, he said this, I believe in the democracy of storytelling. I love the fact that our stories can cross all sorts of borders and boundaries. I grew up in a house, a city, a country, shaped by stories and books. I don't know a greater privilege than that of being allowed to tell a story or to listen to a story. Stories are the only thing we have that can trump life itself. Well, let me tell you, Colm, you've come to the right place. This is the valley of storytelling. <laughs> This is the, the valley where stories do shape who we are. And ultimately, the final story that shapes who we are is our obituary. <laughs> and there are no better stories told in this valley than the ultimate storyline. And I tell you that because I think there's a whole book in the making. Imagine headlines that read, Elizabeth O'Reilly, 99, dies unexpectedly. <laughs> Imagine a place that says, death proves fatal to former area native. <laughs> Imagine a community that closes its obituaries with lines like this, memorial contributions may be made to the donor's favorite charity or bartender. <laughs> Only in this corner of the world. And just a few weeks ago, they all know that a local obituary went viral across the country. And you might want to remember the name because I think it's the basis of the whole story, Kevin McGroarty. He was in Wilkes-Barre in his opening line, said this, only in northeastern Pennsylvania. Kevin McGordy, 57 I think, very young, died at home on Thursday following a lifelong struggle with mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> it is a valley of storytelling and those who come here can never get over it. But because we know that's the ultimate story told about us, we wouldn't dare begin this night without praying so that our stories can be told properly and we can listen fully to your story and to your sharing of your journey with us tonight. So I'll ask you if you stand for just a minute. We have with us Father Daniel Sweeney, SJ, professor with the Political Science Department, who's gonna offer an opening prayer as we begin this night, as we ask God's blessings upon all of us and upon all those who are so wonderful to continue to build this beloved University of Scranton of ours. Father Sweeney, please welcome him. Thank you, Your Grace. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, please join me as we offer our thanks this evening. Lord, we thank you for your good gifts, and today we give thanks in a special way for the gifts bestowed upon our awardee, Colin McCann, husband, father, teacher, novelist, and for his calling as a writer. We likewise thank you for the many and varied talents, gifts, and voices given to others in our midst, others who are brought vividly to life in the pages of Colum's books. Help us as we respond authentically to others, and may our conversations, interactions, and mutual endeavors give glory to you, our benevolent creator and the author of life. Almighty God, 
May the beauty and the evocative power of the written word and the literary talent among us bring us closer to our life's journey toward you. May literature give us a deeper sense of awe before the word who embodies your communication to us. Bless us, Lord, and bless this dinner and the evening we share. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, your happiness. <laughs> I don't know how many of you would remember Bishop DiLorenzo, who was the auxiliary bishop of Scranton many years ago. And he was a very funny guy, but he was a pretty big guy. And somebody said to him one time, what should we call you? He said, you can call me your pulchritude. <laughs> you can call me your eminenza. He said, but don't you ever refer to me as your fullness, or I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> You know, in this valley of ours, we're always trying to figure out how we are connected. So I remember when I was a teenager, I said to my father one time, Dad, I meet an awful lot of Quins along the way. In the course of the journey, I said, how am I supposed to know which ones I'm related to and which ones I'm not? And what he told me back then is as true today as it was then. He said, I'll give you an easy way. If you meet a Quinn who has money, you're not related to them. <laughs> But I'd like to claim I'm related to our president here, whose roots are in the Bronx and whose undergraduate degree is from Fordham. But I'm related in spirit to this wonderful leader. Please welcome our president, Father Kevin Quinn, will offer an official formal word of welcome to all of you and our guest, Father Quinn. Thank you, Monsignor Quinn. Uh, it's important to note he's already stole my thunder, which he often does. Uh, but there is never an opportunity to have too many Quinns on the same program. And especially tonight, as we're honoring an Irish author. Although I also question, um, Joe, do you really work at Fordham? Um, we had our major event last Thursday at the PR Hotel in Manhattan, and uh, Joe gave the invocation, and he's here tonight. But thank you very much. Let me uh, add a word of thanks to all of you joining us here this evening for this very special event at our university. Uh, tonight, uh, we are honoring a renowned author and person with the Royden B. Davis S.J. Distinguished Author Award. It is fitting uh, that the university has chosen to name this award after Father Davis. He was an active member of this proud community in the 1990s and early 2000s, as well as longtime dean of Georgetown College in Washington, D.C. Father Davis was a faithful adv advocate of the liberal arts and spent his career extolling the virtues of a liberal education. Father Davis's legacy lives on today with those who continue to champion liberal arts. His legacy lives on in the people who have been honored with this award at the University of Scranton. So we do gather here tonight in this beautiful building in thanksgiving for those who have carried on the torch of the liberal arts, we honor in a very special way a man who has given so much to the literary world. I am amazed at the extraordinary body of work for our honoree, Colm McCann. Colm has been honored more times than I can count, and you will hear all about these awards later in the program. I have to concede my favorite thing for him, uh, about him is that he's passing on his love of writing to young people as students at Hunter College. By educating future generations of writers, Colm continues the legacy of both the founder of the Jesuit St. Ignatius and Father Davis by fostering the growth of the liberal arts in the 21st century. Colm, you in fact are a beacon for the liberal arts in uncertain times. Your work inspires me and inspires this entire community. In the spirit of St. Ignatius, you are certainly he heeding his call 
to set the world on fire. Simply tonight, I want to say congratulations to you and to your family. And again, to everyone, I want to thank you for this evening and supporting the Weinberg Memorial Library and the University of Scranton. God bless you and God bless the University of Scranton. Thank you. Father Quinn, you're right, there's too many Irish here tonight. Too many Quinns, Sweeties, McCanns, and now the list goes. I don't know whether Colin has heard this, but I'm never enough. Never enough. I, I understand that in Ireland, there's a whole new form of uh, communication in your native city of Dublin, that even husbands and wives are communicating on a new wavelength. I read not long ago of the husband in a pub in Dublin who sent a text to his wife. And he said to her simply, Honey, down at the pub, going to have one more pint. Should be home in 20 minutes. If not, read this again. <laughs> As only the Irish know how to communicate. <laughs> Father Quinn has uh, <laughs> pointed out that funny title, Monsignor. His predecessor, Father McShane, takes it literally and refers to me as my Lord Quinn. <laughs> and at Fordham, it is a confusing title. The abbreviation is MSGR. And the first year I arrived, nearly six years ago, somebody sent a piece of mail addressed to, are you ready for this? Master Sergeant Joseph <laughs> Quinn. So no, they're not as smart as you think they are there at that end of the bridge. And yes, I do still work there, but I back and forth to the city I love and the school I shall always cherish so often that somebody asked me a lot long ago if I commute to Fordham on a daily basis. It sometimes feels that way. Well, I'll give you a title that intrigues me. It's the title of our next speaker. If you notice on your program, it's pretty interesting. I knew kind of the first part of it, but I didn't know the long version of it. And think about it. Our next speaker is the Dean of the Library and Information Fluency. Now, I thought to myself, I hope he's not talking about Hainabonics, <laughs> because that was misericordia. <laughs> the word that I'll always associate with information fluency and language is simply this, scrantastic. <laughs> and nobody is more scrantastic than Dean Charles Cross, who's here tonight to represent this organization, this library, and the lifeblood of it for the last 20 years, the Friends of the Library. Please welcome our good and holy Dean Cross this night, who speaks on behalf of the Weinberg Memorial Library and all the wonderful reasons we come together here this evening. Dean Cross. Now, he did tell me he was going to talk about my title, and I said I would take a few minutes later to explain the history of it. But thank you, Monsignor Quinn. And I have to say, wow, look at this audience tonight. Thank you so much for supporting the Weinberg Library and the Friends of the Weinberg Library. Let's, let's applaud. <laughs> On behalf of the Friends of the, of the Weinberg Library and the Shimo Forum, because we've done this program in collaboration as we've done many programs with the Shimo Forum, welcome to tonight's celebration of, of our 2014 honoree, Colin McCann but also to the 20th anniversary of the Friends of the Weinberg Library, which has become a very special organization for the Weinberg Library. I, just go with me for a few minutes. On a, on, a, on a summer night in June in 1994, a small group of us came together. You know, Father Panuska, who was president of the university, Dick Passan, who was provost, and myself, with an eager group of volunteers, met and these were community volunteers and university volunteers to start this Friends organization. And they always had in mind that we wanted to reach out to the hearts of book lovers. And we had no, no idea where books were going to go in, in terms of you know, print and electronic. But we really, you know, we really wanted to focus on the support of libraries in our communities, not just the University of Scranton, but the community at large, too. So 20 years later, you know, it's particularly pleasing to the dean to be able to say that this organization is thriving and has provided a, a rich history of programs, events, exhibits, you know, annual special gifts to the library, and an endowment created by the, by the you know, at the very grassroots level 
for the Weinberg Library that gives annual gifts to us. So we are, in terms of the library, are truly indebted to all of our friends members, everyone who is here, and all of our members for what you give us. And, and most recently, the recent gift to the friends was a very nice gift to finish the first floor renovation of the new Riley Learning Commons. So if you get a chance to visit the library, visit our first floor. We're most fortunate, we've been most fortunate throughout the years to have great leadership from the community at large. So I want to thank the board presidents, you know, the late Royden Davis, who was the first president and who is um, remembered each year with the giving of our distinguished author. Our past presidents, Connie Shields, Diane Murray, and our current president, Ann Moskowitz, who gives so much to the organization. And in looking back, since this is a 20th anniversary, I don't want to forget the people who are no longer with us, but who gave so much to this organization. Again, and, and these names will measure, you know, Father Davis, but, you know, Governor Bill Scranton, who was with us on the first board of the Friends of the Library back in 1994 and was so dedicated to our organization. Father Richard Darling, uh, an active member of our community. Anne Hatala, who's an alum, who's an alumnist. Ange Angela Casey Cusick, Betty Reddington, who, you know, enjoys the name of one of our buildings. All these people were so active with the Friends, Joan Tate. But most recently, last December, we lost one of our great book lovers and one of my dear friends and our dear friends, Judy Weinberger. Judy was a, a vo voracious reader and a lover of the written word. She was always reading, sometimes three or four things at the same time. And she would all be asking her friends and me, what are you reading? What's the, what's, what, I, what should I be reading? And Judy served actively as a member of our board and as a member of this Distinguished Author Award Series. And in 2009, she chaired the, in that year the event honoring James Grappando. She was always there to help, especially me, make this event the Friends signature event. And I think from what we can see tonight, she would be incredibly proud of that. No deal, no detail was ever left out with Judy. In fact, we even made sure if you had the, you know, the, um, the grilled cheese with tomato soup, that was one of Judy's you know, favorite things. The poet Emily Dickinson once said that there is, she knew nothing in the world as powerful as a word. And so how true that is tonight when you think about it. Well, I know nothing more powerful than a true friend and a supporter of the written word and libraries. And Judy was that and more. She loved this event so much. And as her husband, Jerry, knew when she loved something, and Jerry's with us tonight with his family, she really loved it. So to Jerry, who sponsored our author's honorarium in loving memory of Judy, and to our sons Andrew and Jonathan and their families who are with us tonight, please know that Judy will live in our hearts each year as we celebrate our distinguished author. Just a, a couple of final things. Planning an event could not be done without the contributions of many people, and I want to recognize our sponsors and say how much we appreciate their support. You find each one of them listed in their event program, and several of them have been with us since the very beginning in 1997. Their generosity and your generosity not only, not only helps us make this evening possible, but support, has supported all of our students. Um, I'm almost 30 of them in, in, who have been able to attend tonight, so I'm so grateful to them. I want to, I'm also grateful to the outstanding group of volunteers. They're all in our program, the planning committee. Sergeant Myers, who, you know, who's chaired this event, Ann Moskowitz, who we've talked about before. And finally, I want to thank Betsy Moylan, Professor Betsy Moylan. She's been, from the beginning, everybody, no, everybody knows Betsy in this room. She's been with us, me, from the beginning of the Friends of the Library. And she was even on Friday afternoon helping us put tables together. And thank you to Kim, my assistant, Kim Fetzko, who is always doing a fantastic job coordinating the events. So what makes this evening so special to the University Library and its friends? It's pretty simple when you come down to it. We get this great opportunity, this special opportunity, to take a few minutes away from our very hectic, busy schedules and lives to celebrate, for me, the true craft of writing. 
and what better person to represent that than the person that we have here tonight. Our honoree said it best in Let the Great World Spin. Literature can remind us that not all life is already written down. There are still many stories to be told, and he certainly has done that, and we look forward to even more. So, Colm, tonight we celebrate the stories that you tell in such a fluid, lyrical way, and the beautiful ways that you weave together for me, you know, fact and history and imagination. Thank you so much for that special look into your world, and congratulations from all of us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thanks for reminding us of the why of tonight. What is it they say? What we do is nowhere near as interesting as why. And uh, thank you for pointing our attention to those who really have sustained the vibrancy of this organization for the last 20 years. Uh, and I'd love to hear you mention St. Betsy of Moylan because she has been such an incredible part of the lives of anybody who knows anything about our library. Delighted to hear you mention uh, Judith Weinberger, whose uh, lives have touched ours in such, such fashion of a way. But, uh, as all of you know, when we gather in this community of ours, uh, it takes a while to get to the main event because we're always introducing the one who will introduce the one who will introduce the one who's going to introduce the one who's going to introduce the one. And we're there. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you we're there. And of course, who would be the best to do that but the chair of this committee tonight, whose titles uh, belie her importance in this community and her lifelong passion for it. Uh, to say that she is the Senior Fellow of International Civic and Cultural Projects, Director of the Schimmel Forum, and Chair of this gathering tonight barely tells the story. But we'll save that for another night when we have Sandra right in the middle. Please welcome Sandra Myers, an extraordinary force of her own here in our community, who has always served us with great passion. Sandra, who lives out the words of Ignatius, Lord, teach us to be generous, teach us to serve you as you deserve. She does. Let's thank her again, Sandra Myers. And so to the author. Um, Hal Mancan is a distinguished author. No doubt about that. But what distinguishes him is almost ineffable. Frank McCourt called Let the Great World Spin a heartbreaking symphony. Yes and no. It has the scale, the significance, the dignity, and the richness of a symphony. Different voices, different movements, different harmonies and cacophonies. But there is more. His works at, are at once heartbreaking and heartening, artful and artless. That is, seamless even in their complexity, mundane even in their elegance. Readers are drawn to empathize with the somewhat hapless and almost hopeless cast of characters in Let the Great World Spin, because Colin McCann, by his own empathy, leads us to do that. He calls to my mind another contemporary author, Amos Oz, who said in accepting the Goethe Prize in Germany that reading fiction helps us to imagine the other thereby making us more immune to the ploys of the devil, including the inner devil, the Mephisto of the heart. Oz goes on so far, to, so far as to say that, and I quote, imagining the other is not only an aesthetic tool, it is, in my view, a major moral imperative. These are not the words of our honoree, but these words reminded me of the experience I had in reading Carl McCann's work. His exquisite empathy never descends into sentimentality. His acceptance of others doesn't reflect naivete but wisdom. The gentle nature, his gentle nature, is muscular. He leads us to embrace the all-encompassing of the other. I won't say more except that his acceptance of this award will stand as a badge of honor for our university and our library throughout the years. Thank you. Now I 
I will ask the author, Colin McCann, and Don, um, um, our new, <laughs> our new <laughs> provost, Don Boomgarden, to come forward. In recognition of your remarkable literary achievements, the University of Scranton's Friends of the Weinberg Memorial Library honors you, Colum, with its 2014 Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award and Citation. The citation reads, the Royden B. Davis Distinguished Author Award presented to Colum McCann, noted author. I have found my music in a common word from Jesuit poet Jared Manley Hopkins. The citation is dated 18 October 2014 and signed by Ann Moskowitz, president of the Friends of the Weinberg Memorial Library, and Charles E. Kratz, dean of the Weinberg Memorial Library and Information Fluency. Colin, congratulations from the University of Pennsylvania. nervous now. <laughs> I was going to try and make a joke and say, Monsignor Kelly? <laughs> Father Kelly? <laughs> no, but seriously, um, Monsignor Quinn, uh, Father Quinn, everybody who's here, um, I'm a little, I am a little choked up. This is, um, this is a, 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 a beautiful moment to hear um, Jared Manley Hopkins. Um, Brings me brings me back to my childhood, and I'll tell you um, a little bit more about that um, uh, in in a while. But um, to be here, I have to say I've been here for two days, um, and uh, I know that this is an extraordinary place. I had an amazing um, couple of hours this morning with the uh, faculty, students, and a couple of former students, uh, and I felt the energy uh, radiate. Uh, out of the room, and um, I felt that I was in the presence of um, minds who would teach me so much more than I was available to um, to, to to even talk about or ask about. And it was it was one of those great things. You go to certain places honestly, and you can feel the privilege, um, like like sloughing off of them. This is not one of those places. I felt today that everybody, there was nothing entitled. Um, about what was happening um, on, on, on these grounds. There was nothing entitled about the questions, and there was a, the, the, there was a, a tremendous community uh, and spirit that speaks to the, you know, the Jesuit background, but also speaks to decency and, 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 and togetherness. And, um, and so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really, truly humbled um, uh, by this honor. So um, thank you so, so much for, um, for inviting me here. And can I say, it's amazing to go to a place and, and have uh, people say, thank you for coming here, because you guys actually invited me, right? <laughs> thank you so much. I really have so much I want to say, and, and shut me up after a while, OK? Because I'm Irish and just keep going on and on and on. I might start singing eventually. It's like it gets, it gets really bad at the end of the evening. Um, but you know what? I missed you guys 28 years ago, because uh, I, uh, came to, um, I came to the United States. I was a journalist in, um, in uh, Dublin. I just started um, doing journalism actually at the age of 12, but I got a full-time job at the age of 7. I didn't go to college at all, um, but I gave up my job um, at the age of 21, um, went to Hyannis, in, um, Cape Cod, and then took a bicycle um, across the United States. And I came through Easton, and I came, but I just missed um, coming through Scant Scranton. So maybe I could have stayed here, maybe I would have married here, who knows what would have happened. But, but I have to say that I enjoyed being, being here. Um, 
And it was really the first part of, um, when I hit um, Pennsylvania, I got rid of that all sorts of, like Massachusetts, New York um, nervousness, and, and, um, and, 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 um, and really it felt to me that the, 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 my journey had actually begun. Um, it was a 12,000 mile journey uh, on a bicycle with two pannier bags at the front, two pannier bags at the back, a sleeping bag in the tent, and I slept out. Um, but I do remember the hospitality of, uh, of, of people here. And um, so it's, it's a pleasure to actually, uh, even though I've been back many, many, many times, of course, to this sort of area, but it's a pleasure to feel like I'm really back. And it honestly does feel like a home. And I don't know what you guys do in order to make this feel like a university that's cohesive and, and proper and decent and right. But whatever you're doing, uh, you're absolutely doing um, a, a, an incredible job. And what I want to do this evening is I want to read a little bit uh, from, 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 from two books. Um, I have all these pages prepared, and I'm just going to like, um, but I think the best thing is to sort of, um, I'll, I'll read a little bit and then um, I throw it open for for, for questions, uh, and um, maybe we can have a dialogue, and then maybe somebody other than me will sing at some stage. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah, I know we have some Irish people. At, there are lots of Irish people here tonight. It's like, like, put up your hand. Who's not Irish? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, Anyway, thank you so much, and this is a, a, an, an incredible honor to have. Um, so I'm going to read uh, first from um, a couple of little pieces from Let the Great World Spin. Uh, but to give you a context, um, so on um, September the 11th, uh, um, 2001, uh, I was in New York. Um, I'd been there for already for a number of years, um, and we were all there. We were there if we were in Belfast. We were there if we were in Bangor, Maine. We were there if we were in Baghdad. We were there. No matter where in the world we happened to be, we were all there at that particular moment. But I do remember um, th uh, when it happened that my father-in-law, Roger Hawk, uh, who was working with a law company at that stage, was on the 59th floor. And when I turned around that morning and saw uh, the towers on the television, um, he was in the first tower to be hit, the second tower to come down, and I thought, wow, um, this is something um, that will, uh, I will have to learn how to negotiate um, in some way. Um, he got out. He walked the five miles from uh, the World Trade Center to the apartment where I was living. Um, I'm the least cool writer in the whole of New York. I live in the Upper East Side. Um, <laughs> And we were living at that stage on 71st Street. Um, and, um, but I will never forget how he um, came down the corridor where we lived. And my daughter, who was four at the time, Isabella, jumped up into his arms, Poppy, Poppy. And then she ran away from him. And, and, and I said, I found her later hidden in a cupboard. She was like hiding away. And um, I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, Poppy's burning. And I said, no, no, Poppy's not burning. It's just the smoke on his clothes from a fire that was downtown, because you don't want to say things to kids. Um, and uh, she said, no, no, Dad, you don't understand. Poppy's burning from the inside out. And I will never forget that moment when I, I it was like that actual day when I realized, you know, someday I will write about this. Someday I will, uh, like, like every uh, American, like every, person who's actually experienced 9-11 will have to negotiate it somehow. And for a long time, I was angry. I have to tell you, I'm be, to be honest with you, I was angry about what was happening. I was angry about troops. I was angry about Shannon Airport in Ireland. I was angry about things that were being done in the name of my kids or in my own name. And, um, and, 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 um, but I held for a long time this image of uh, Philippe Petit, who wrote, who, who walked the tightrope between the World Trade Center towers in August 1974. This man who did this spectacular act of bravery um, uh, and creation, it, which was in perfect opposition to the act of destruction of the towers coming down. So this man walks a quarter of a mile in the sky. Can you imagine what it's like being out there on a tightrope? A quarter of a mile. And that's your drop. Um, 
in, and, and to me, it worked in opposition <clears throat> uh, to that act of evil, that act of evil genius. And that's maybe what's most evil about it was, was that it was genius um, that brought um, the towers down and brought the world to a different place. Um, so I knew I wanted to write about it. Um, and, um, but the further I got into it, quite honestly, the more I wanted to write about healing, the more I wanted to write about grace, the, war, the more I wanted to write about the fact that things don't end, that there is no end to history, that we must get up, that we must recover, that we must, um, that we must go on. And um, for it, even though I haven't been, 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 been too good um, in relation to my background and my faith, for it, I relied a lot on my own upbringing in Dublin, in Ireland, as part of... Um, uh, and you'll forgive me for this, because um, um, for, for quite a while, I was not a lapsed Catholic, but a collapsed Catholic. Um, but I wanted to write about all of those good people who were doing incredible things in the world. And I think um, the first section that I wanted to read for you today is about what's going on uh, with the good people who are working here in this university and have uh, envisioned um, the faith that we can have. So this is about a character called Corrigan. Corrigan told me once that Christ was quite easy to understand. He went where he was supposed to go. He stayed where he was needed. He took little or nothing along, a pair of sandals, a bit of a shirt, a few odds and ends to stave off the loneliness. He never rejected the world. If he had rejected it, he would have been rejecting mystery. And if he rejected mystery, he would have been rejecting faith. What Corrigan wanted was a fully believable God, one you could find in the grime of the everyday. The comfort he got from the hard, cold truth, the filth, the war, the poverty, was that life could be capable of small beauties. He wasn't interested in the glorious tales of the afterlife or the notions of a honey-soaked heaven. To him, that was a dressing room for hell. Rather, he consoled himself with the fact that in the real world, when he looked closely into the darkness, he might find the presence of a light, damaged and bruised, but a little light, all the same. He wanted, quite simply, for the world to be a better place. And he was in the habit of hoping for it. Out of that came some sort of triumph that went beyond theological proof, a cause for optimism against all the evidence. Someday, he said, the meek might actually want it. So, I think someday the meek might actually want it. Right, Monsignor? Um, I think we've got to create it that way. I think we've got to work, work towards it that way. Um, a little piece uh, about, uh, about war um, and um, a mother sending her son off to war less than half a page, is from the point of view of a woman who lives on Park Avenue, um, and her son has gone off to work in computers in, in Vietnam. She wanted to tell him so much on the tarmac the day he left. The world is run by brutal men, and the surest proof is their armies. If they ask you to stand still, you should dance. If they ask you to burn the flag, wave it. If they ask you to murder, recreate, theorem, anti-theorem, corollary, anti-corollary, underline it twice, it's all there in the numbers. Listen to your mother. Listen to me, Joshua. It's, look me in the eyes. I have something to tell you. But he stood, buzz-haired and red-cheeked in front of her, and she said nothing. Say something to him that shine to his cheeks. Say something. Tell him, tell him. But she just smiled. Solomon pressed the star of David into his hands and turned away and said, be brave. She kissed his forehead goodbye. She noticed the way the back of his uniform creased and uncreased in perfect symmetry. And she knew, she just knew, the moment she saw him go, that she was seeing him go forever. 
Hello, Central, give me heaven. I think my Joshua is there. I can't indulge this heart sickness, no. Spoon the coffee out and line the tea bags up. Imagine endurance, there's a, a logic to that. Imagine and hang on. So, how is it being dead, son? And would I like it? Okay, so that's a real downer. So I'm now going to read, try and read something, something a little bit funny. Because it is Saturday Night Live, after all. Okay, so um, this is a section of the book um, that's purely, purely autobiographical. Um, the, um, the speaker is a 38-year-old African-American hooker. <laughs> My wife... Um, jokes that this, is, that, that this actually is the only uh, like vaguely autobiographical uh, part of the book. And you will see, see why from the second and third sentence. So concentrate closely. This is just a very short piece from the point of view of Tilly, who lives in the Bronx, on the day that Philippe Petit does his tightrope walk across the World Trade Center towers. Apologies, there's a little bit of bad language. It's all right, right? I got another trick I thought I recognized. He was young but bald on top. <laughs> Come on, you're slow tonight. Come on. The bald spot was very white, like a little ice rink on top of his head. <laughs> So he got a room in the Waldorf Astoria. The first thing he did was he pulled the curtains tight and he fell on the bed and he said, let's get it on. I was like, wow, do I know you, honey? He looked at me hard and said, no. Are you sure? I said, all cutesy and shit. You look familiar. No, he said, real angry. Hey, take a chill pill, honey. I said, I'm only axing. So I pulled off his belt and unzipped him and he moaned, oh yeah, 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 like they all do. And he closed his eyes and he kept on moaning. And then I don't know why, but I figured it out. It was the guy from the weather report on CBS. <laughs> Except he wasn't wearing his toupee. <laughs> that was his disguise. So I finished him off and got myself dressed and waved goodbye. But I turned at the door and said to him, hey man, it's cloudy in the east with the wind at 10 knots and a chance of snow. There I was, cracking myself up. <laughs> so she's rather rude. Now, can you imagine my mum at home in Dublin? So I grew up in, 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 in sort of Dublin. I actually had the, 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 the the worst thing that you can possibly have as a novelist um, growing up. I had a happy childhood, right? <laughs> my parents were together, my dad came home in the afternoon, my mum cut the edge off the lettuce and tomato sandwiches, you know, <laughs> everything was, was grand. But can you imagine my mum? So she raises this boy, like, and, 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 and I go to the Christian Brothers School and, you know, come home every afternoon and chat with her. And then suddenly he goes away on his bicycle and then he starts writing about hookers underneath the Major Deegan. <laughs> I will also tell you that um, my first novel was a novel called Song Dogs. And in it, there's a, uh, one of the gentlemen here has a son called Connor Lyons. But in it, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the protagonist uh, is more or less my age when, 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 when I was writing the, uh, the novel. Um, and um, you know, it takes place in Ireland, but it's a Mexican mother and an Irish father. Uh, and um, uh, the, the father takes sort of, shall we say, compromised photographs of the mother, uh, who's, a, who's a great beauty. And my mum, who's from Derry, a little farm in Derry, and, and, and um, she gets phone calls from her friends saying, Sally, we read Colum's book. And there's a silence at the end. And, 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 yeah. and she said, Sally, we didn't know you were Mexican. <laughs> and they're like, did Sean really take those naughty photographs of you in the bath? 
Well, my poor mom had to deal with ha, had to deal with all that, and I and I had to eventually say to her that 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 um, you know um, my life because um, they gave me a good life. They gave me um, you know a solid life, a solid upbringing, uh, 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 and access to literature. Um, but what they really also gave me was an access um, to otherness, and they allowed me to go. Um, and that was um, you know one one of the most important things. Somebody asked me today who was one of the most important figures um, in, in in my life, and there have been a lot of important figures in terms of literature. There were teachers in particular, but but. but my mother and father were incredibly important to me um, in, 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 in the way that I learned how to deal with the world and also to get rid of myself. So I spent most of my life um, waking up in the morning, looking at myself in the mirror saying, oh my God, I don't want to spend another 24 hours with you. Um, I'd rather be someone or somewhere else. And um, I talked a lot with Sandra um, about this. Um, the, um, yesterday evening uh, and today, uh, the value of us learning how to be other. This is what a university education gives. This is why we're 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 here tonight because um, you know, this is important stuff. Um, I know we're all hanging around, we're having fun, we're having a few drinks and all those things, but really what's incredibly important is that we expand the lungs of the world. Not just the lungs of ourselves, but we expand the lungs of the world by thinking constantly um, about the notion of, of, of otherness. Um, for me, that happened uh, when I came through Pennsylvania. It happened when I went down to Florida. It happened when I on the, went on the bicycle across the Texas into Mexico, back up through New Mexico, uh, into Canada. I finished coming across the Golden Gate Bridge, um, crying my eyes out after 12,000 miles on this bicycle. Uh, finally understanding, you know, at the tender age of 23, that, um, that, 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 that we really do live in a vast democracy. And having heard about, you know, and read about Tocqueville, having read about American democracy and all these things, but I had actually experienced a true democracy, and that was the democracy um, of storytelling. Uh, that when I went from place to place, you know, being um, in, in, in towns here in Pennsylvania, being um, with uh, Amish people in Lancaster, uh, you know, going. Um, to Mississippi, uh, being in New Orleans, being in Mexico. Everybody had a story to tell, and everybody um, uh, had, a, had a deep need to tell that story. And that's what I wanted to try and achieve with Let the Great World Spin. And the last little piece I'm going to read to you from Let the Great World Spin is actually kind of what, what, what ties it together in a certain way. There is a page, um, or there's a photograph on a page 237, if anybody has the book in front of them, um, of Philippe Petit walking the tightrope um, uh, between the World Trade Center towers uh, in New York in 1974. It's not photoshopped in any manner or means, but there is a, there's a plane about to go uh, across the sky in the background. But because of the angle of the photograph, it was taken by Vin de Lucia, uh, or Vic de Lucia, by, uh, with a 400 milliliter lens. Um, it looks like the plane is about to smash into uh, the building. And of course, it, it, it doesn't. I attribute it to one of my characters. And this final piece, uh, I hope in some way, it suggests to you um, my uh, philosophy of literature, but also perhaps my philosophy of 9-11. Before I move on to Transatlantic and read you one or two short pieces uh, from Transatlantic. Let the Great World Spin comes from a title from Tennyson. Let the great world spin forever down the ringing grooves of change. Tennyson in, was also inspired by the Mualaquat, which were the suspended poems or the hanging poems that were in pre-Islamic, um, uh, you know, sixth-century um, marketplaces. And in those poems, the most beautiful line of all to me was, "Is there any hope that this?" desolation can bring me solace. And I say to you that that probably is our job. 
um, as thinkers, as people who engage in society, as people who know how tough it can be and, 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 and uh, how hard other people generally have it, is there any way that this desolation that we face can uh, bring us solace? And I think there is, and I'll, I'll hopefully talk about, uh, about that a, a, a little bit more. But I think you people are very much engaged in this, and I salute you for it. Because by contributing to a university, and by contributing to our, our ideas, we question the notion of desolation. Because we know it's there. And so, OK, no big deal. It's there. Anybody can tell us it's there. What I'm interested in is the people who can bring us away from the desolation. To me, cynics are two a penny. They're not very interesting. They're not very muscular. Um, well, the optimists are the truly muscular ones who can get away from all of that. This little section is kind of about that. Keep in mind, Philippe Petit on a tightrope walk between the two uh, World Trade Center towers. The section. Uh, is also a line from Tennyson, roaring seaward and I go. She often wonders, what is it that holds that man so high in the air? What sort of ontological glue up there in his haunted silhouette, a dark thing against the sky, a small stick figure in the vast expanse, the plain on the horizon, the tiny thread of rope between the edges of the buildings, the bar in his hands, the great spread of space. The photo was taken on the same day her mother died. It was one of the reasons she was attracted to it in the first place, the sheer fact that such beauty had occurred at the same time. She had found it yellowing and torn in a garage sale in San Francisco four years ago. At the bottom of a box of photographs, the world delivers its surprises. She bought it, got it framed, kept it with her as she went from hotel to hotel. A man high in the air, while a plane disappears, it seems, into the edge of the building, one small scrap of history meeting a larger one, as if the walking man were somehow anticipating what could come later, the intrusion of time and history, the collision point of stories. We wait for the explosion, but it never occurs. The plane passes, the tightrope walker gets to the end of the wire, things don't fall apart. And it strikes her now as an enduring moment, the man alone against scale, still capable of myth in the face of all other evidence. So that's, um, I suppose that is my uh, philosophy of literature and life, is that we are still capable of myth in the face of all other evidence. So you balance all that turmoil, you balance all that difficulty, and you say, there it is, it's true. You go to downtown Scranton, or you go to, to you know, go to the South Bronx in, in, in New York where I live, or I go to Limerick, or I go to Belfast. You know, I can see the turmoil, I can see the desolation. Is it enough for me just to describe it? No. Um, as a person who engages in society, who believes in many things, I think I have to go so much further than the actual physical description of what's going on and try to find some sort of form of, um, of solace that's going on behind it. And that, to me, um, is the, uh, the essence of, um, of literature. Um, because when I step into a book, hopefully, I step out of my skin and away from myself. Uh, stories uh, stop the flow of time. Lessons do too. Let's not forget that. Lessons, you know, classes stop the flow of time. And writing and teaching, they save the present moment. And books continue long after the space and time of their existence. So literature succeeds in remapping the body that we live inside. What an incredible thing. We don't have to be young anymore. We don't have to be old anymore. We can be other. Um, we can have our own internal topography. And, and we must 
uh, in the process of all of this, in the process of looking at ourselves, learn how to get lost. Because we all have these internal GPS systems that tell us where and where to go. Um, but sometimes uh, we must learn to get lost. And we get lost. I, I shouldn't tell you to get lost and even like, get lost. Uh, but you know what I mean. Sometimes we have to get lost. Um, and literature allows us to do this in the most extraordinary way. Um, and I like this for me personally, in becoming other. Um, and we can live our, our, our lives um, in, in, in a variety of ways. I love writing personally from a variety of voices. I don't want to be the, 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 the kid who grew up in Dublin in the suburbs, having it easy with that uh, easy childhood. Um, perhaps this is a failure on my part. Perhaps I should only write about myself. I don't think so, though. Um, I tend to believe that our ability to look at others is a, an acknowledgement of the necessity of polyphony and symphony. John Berger, uh, the English author who lives in the, the south of France, uh, says, never again will a single story be told as if it were the only one. And the ability to see from a variety of angles is crucial to the modern experience. We cannot understand otherness if we don't make an, an attempt to step into somebody else's shoes. And the more we choose to see, the more that we will see. And this is about complicated truth uh, and beautiful truth. And truth, in essence, must be made up from a variety of truths. We must put them together and weigh them up. Um, one of the things, uh, and I won't go on too much longer and open it up for questions soon, but one of the things that I wanted to write about after writing this book uh, about 9-11 is I wanted to write a book about peace. I thought it was, it, it was very, very important uh, to write about peace. The great Irish story of the last uh, 100 years is not our rebellion, not our, uh, you know, uh, our emergence from under the shadow of an empire that was beside us, not any of that. It was the fact that after 700 years, we were somehow able to achieve peace. We achieved peace, um, and we should all take, take credit for it, because um, uh, a number of American people uh, and statesmen and stateswomen uh, got together and said, it is time for all of this to end, in particular, um, uh, Senator George Mitchell. Senator George Mitchell, to me, is one of the great heroes uh, of our time who helped Ireland negotiate our peace process. Anyway, this book, Transatlantic, is about peace. It's about Frederick Douglass, who goes to Ireland seeking the peace of an African-American slave who wants to get rid of slavery. It's about Alcock and Brown, who fly from Newfoundland to Ireland um, in a modified bomber. They change it from a bomber to a weapon of peace. They put in petrol tanks, and they make a grand transatlantic journey. And then it's also about Senator George Mitchell, who tries to achieve peace. And I'm just going to read you. Um, two pieces, one a little disturbing and one hopefully a little bit more uplifting uh, that go to the heart and essence uh, of what peace uh, might be about. The first one is about Frederick Douglass. It's 1846 in Ireland. He's traveling in a carriage. Um, he's with his publisher, Richard Webb, and um, he meets an Ashling, a, a vision of uh, of Ireland, um, and it is not a, uh, it is a vision of the, the Irish famine. So this is Frederick Douglass. They continued south, just over the river Barrow, they took a wrong turn. They entered wild country, broken fences, ruined castles, stretches of bogland, wooded headlands, turf smoke rose from the cabins, thin and mean. On the muddy paths, they glimpsed moving rags. The rags seemed more animate than the bodies within. As they passed, the families regarded them. The children appeared marooned by hunger. A hut burned at the side of the road. The smoke looked like it was issuing from the ground. In the fields near stunted trees, men stared balefully into the distance. One man's mouth was smeared with a brown paste. Perhaps he had been eating bark. 
The man watched impassively as the carriage went by and then raised his stick as if bidding goodbye to himself. He staggered across the field, a dog padding at his heels. They saw him fall to his knees and then rise again, continuing on into the distance. A dark young woman picked berries from the brushes. There was red juice all down the front of her dress. As if she were vomiting them up one after the other, she smiled jaggedly. Her teeth were all gone. She repeated a phrase in Irish. It sounded like a form of prayer. Douglas grasped Webb's arm. Webb looked ill. A paleness at his throat, he did not want to talk. There was a smell out over the land. The soil had been turned. The blight had flung its rotten odor into the air. The potato crop was ruined. It's all they eat, said Webb. But why? It's all they have, he said. Surely not. For everything else, they rely on us. British soldiers galloped past, hoofing mud up onto the hedgerows, green hats with red badges like small splashes of blood against the land. The soldiers were young and they were frightened. There was an air of insurrection about the countryside. Even the birds seemed to howl up out of the trees. They thought they heard the cry of a wolf, but Webb said that the last wolf had been shot in the country a half century before. Creeley, the driver, began to whimper that perhaps it was a banshee. Ah, quit your foolishness, said Webb. Drive on. But, sir, drive on, Creeley. At an estate house, they stopped to see if they could feed the horses. Three guards stood on the gate, stone-carved falcons at their shoulders. The guards had shovels in their hands, but the handles of the shovels had been sharpened to a point. The landlords were absent. There had been a fire. The house smoldered. Nobody was allowed past. They were under strict instructions. The guards looked at Douglas, and they tried to contain their sight, their surprise at the sight of a negro. Get out of here, the guard said now. Creeley pushed the carriage on, the roads twisted, hedges rose high around them, night threatened, the horses slowed, they looked ruined. A gout of spittle and foam hung from their long jaws. Ah, oh, move it, please, called Webb from the inner cab where he sat knee to knee with Douglas. Under a canopy of trees, the carriage came to a creaking stop. A silence pulled in around them. They heard a woman's voice under the muted hoof shuffle. It sounded as if she was invoking a blessing. What is it? called Webb. Creeley did not answer. Move it, man, it's getting dark. Still, the carriage did not budge. Webb snapped the bottom of the door open with his foot, and he stepped down from the inner cab. Douglas followed. They stood in the black bath of trees. In the road, they saw the cold and grainy shape of a woman. She wore a gray woolen shawl and the remnants of a green dress. She had been dragging behind her a very small bundle of twigs attached to a strap around her shoulders, pulling the contraption in her wake. On the twigs lay a small parcel of white. The woman gazed up at them. Her eyes shone. A high ache tightened her voice. You'll help my child, sir, she said to Webb. Pardon me. God bless you, sir. You'll help my child. She lifted a baby from the raft of twigs. Good God, said Webb. An arm flopped out from the bundle. The woman took the arm back into the rags. For the love of God, the child's hungry, she said. A wind had risen up. She could hear, they could hear the branches of the trees slapping each other around. Here, said Webb, offering the woman a coin. But she did not take it. She bent her head instead. She seemed to recognize her own shame on the ground. She's not had a thing to eat, said Douglas. Webb fumbled in a small leather purse again and held out a sixpenny piece. Still, the woman did not take it. The baby was clutched to her chest. The men stood rooted to the spot. A paralysis had swept over them. Creeley looked away. Douglas felt himself become the dark of the road. The woman thrust the baby forward. The smell of death was overpowering. And that was Ireland at that time. Um, I told you it was a downer. Um, I, will, uh, I, I will hopefully uh, 
No, but I think it's important. I think literature has to negotiate this territory. Um, I think we do have to go to those dark, sort of some, somewhat anonymous corners and then rescue something out of it, twist something out of it. Um, uh, as writers or as teachers or as priests or as mothers and fathers, that's our job, to rescue from those little dark corners, some sort of modicum of light. The person who read, rescued the most light that I can see for a long, long time um, in my country, um, and I give him so much credit, is Senator George Mitchell. He was an amazing man, went across for three years, uh, going back and forth to help us negotiate our peace process. Um, they called him Iron Pants because he could sit in the chair so long uh, and listen to the Irish go on and on and on. Um, Declan and I, where is he? He's like, uh, we, had a, um, we had a laugh today about the Irish just, you'll, ne you'll never shut us up. You, know? you will, you'll never shut us up. But I wanted to write him a myth. I wanted to acknowledge what it was that he had done. And so the, the, the image that came to mind was that we, the Irish people, North, South, Republican, Loyalist, Plantation, whatever way, way you wanted to think of it, we were throwing our words at him. And he just sat there and he accepted all our words in the most extraordinary way. And this is why we were able to negotiate peace, because he listened. He was the most amazing listener. Um, and I'm going to read this half page and then uh, open it up for questions then uh, afterwards and um, we can all raise a glass together. But I think in a certain way, I'm not just talking about peace here in this section, I'm also talking about education. I'm also talking about my theory of education. I'm talking about my theory of universities um, and all of us who are sort of um, at the coal face and we have to learn how to, um, to accept um, the the opinions of others and then turn it at a certain time. So this is Northern Ireland, 1994, is it? Yeah. Yes. It is as if, in a myth, he has visited an empty grain silo. In the beginning, he stood at the bottom in the resounding dark, several figures gathered at the very top of the silo. They peered down, shaded their eyes, and they began to drop their pieces of grain upon him, words. A small rain at first, full of vanity and history and rancor, clattering in the emptiness. He stood and he let a sound metallic around him until it began to pour down. And the grain took on a different sound and he had to reach up and keep knocking the words aside just to get a little space to breathe. Dust and chaff in the air all around him from their very own fields. They were pouring down their winnowed bitterness. And in his silence, he just kept thrashing, spluttering, pushing the words away, a refusal to drown. But what nobody noticed, not even himself, was that the grain kept rising. And the silo filled, and he kept rising with it. And the sounds grew different, word upon word, falling around him, building beneath him. And now, at the top of the silo, he has clawed himself up and he has dusted himself off. And he stands there equal with the pourers who are astounded by the language that lies below them. They glance at each other. There are three ways down from this silo. They can fall into the grain and they can drown. They can jump off the edge and abandon it. Or... They can learn to sew it very slowly at their feet. Thank you. And, and, and I, I do think that, that that's what we do. We can, we can learn to, to sew it um, very slowly uh, at, at, at our feet. And I still believe, you know, um, in the face of all that, that other evidence, that we can have some sort of um, 
some sort of optimism about it. But I want to open it up now, and I don't have my eyes in, so if, uh, if, if, if I don't notice you at the back of the room, and I have to tell you that uh, I'm also a really bad thing. I'm also a teacher, so if nobody asks me a question very quickly, I'm gonna call somebody out. <laughs> and the person who's definitely not looking at me is the person I'm gonna call out. <laughs> no, but seriously. <laughs> is there uh, um, any comment? Oh, are there are microphones back there, yeah. Hello, thank you so much. Oh, the microphone's okay, great. I'm Gretchen Van Dyke, I teach political science, international politics, so not only am I familiar with the process for peace in Ireland, but I know that um, at the beginning of the Obama administration, George Mitchell was appointed the special envoy um, to Israel and Palestine, right. and yet that was not as successful. So right. is it that it was a very specific set of circumstances that allowed him to be successful in Ireland um, and yet walked away from the situation that continues to um, control our world in Israel and Palestine? Senator Mitchell would say, uh, in answer to this question, I believe he would say, uh, yes, there were special circumstances uh, in Ireland. He was allowed a chance. Um, the, the people who were there, they, you know, uh, and had looked at it, uh, they'd become grandfathers, and they were saying, you know, you know what's going on? They, they were available for peace. Even though, in the whole peace process in Northern Ireland, the, the, the two sides, if you call it two sides, really eight, nine sides, never got in the same room together, ever. In the whole time before the peace process, uh, they, they, they didn't come into the room. Uh, Paisley would go into a room where Adams had been and would spray air freshener in the room, you know? Um, but you know what Mitchell did? Mitchell allowed it to happen and, 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 and didn't just sort of like, uh, you know, push on one side, didn't, didn't, didn't say, we have to have this happen now. He allowed people to tell their stories. There is nothing more dignified in the world than allowing people to tell their stories. Nothing even better than somebody listening to your story, truly listening to your story. Uh, and um, so when I think when he went to the Middle East, he wasn't given the proper chance. Uh, I think, um, you know, he would, he, he, he wished that he could have carried that energy from uh, Ireland. But Ireland was a little simpler, a little simpler, even though it was incredibly complicated than, um, than the Middle East. Do I believe that it's possible that somebody will come along someday and, 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 and do something for us in the Middle East? I have to believe so. I think there are some incredible organizations. And I think it's all from the ground up. I think it's from our kids. I think it's from uh, you know, people trying to understand and being more agile in relation to what it means to be, to, uh, to, to be other. And I think, it, uh, I think it's possible. Is that naive? Uh, do I risk? Naivety? Do I risk sentimentality? Absolutely, I do. Because I would prepare, be prepared to be uh, the person who's wearing his heart on the sleeve, then be the cynic in the corner, squinting and saying, not, n n "Nothing is possible." Um, and I think, quite frankly, it comes from here. Um, and I think, uh, for for from for many many years, good things have come from here. There's some bad things that come from here too. But um, the energy of the peace process in the Middle East. Uh, will be um, an American energy and possibly, quite possibly, a conservative energy um, that, uh, from, from this country rather than a, a, a liberal energy. Um, and everybody might, will, will get on board. Who knows? But um, I hope so, right? Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Pat Gross. I retired a year ago from this wonderful place. I cannot thank you enough for the hours of enjoyment you gave me in becoming a gypsy in Europe, mm. a sand hog in New York. The ending of that, this side of brightness, blew me away. You are about redemption, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, and thank you for it. Uh, one of the hard things to be is to be that person who, um, who, 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 who says um, there is some sort of possibility. Because I, I, trust me, I get hammered for it in, in some of the more quote unquote um, intellectual um, journals. Um, even though I portray, like Brodsky says it best, he talks about like um, the darkness. Um, but only the light, only a little bit of light will show us what the darkness is. And only the darkness will show us also wh 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 what the light happens to be. Um, but um, if I go back and read all the Nobel speeches uh, down through the years, virtually all the writers from Steinbeck to Heaney, uh, you know, all talked about, uh, and Faulkner in, in, in particular, you know, uh, talked about um, the the human heart in conflict with itself, love, pride, pity, compassion, all these things. And in the end, uh, you know, our duty as women and men is to, to, is to stand up and say there is some sort of uh, available light at the end. Otherwise, you know, uh, why, why, why bother with it? But um, the novel that you talked about is kind of my, um, my, um, my orphan novel that nobody reads uh, the, uh, or well, thank you. It's about um, it's about um, the Romani population in, or, or it's about a Romani woman in um, e in Eastern Slovakia, uh, and she walks across Europe. She gets exiled. She's a gypsy, basically. Though that's a pejorative term. But look, uh, you know, I spend my life. Uh, getting into all these things, I'm very lucky. I'm really, really lucky. I write towards what I want to write about, and I get these projects, and then I live my life for a couple of years. So I lived with the homeless people in the subway tunnels for, the, for, for a year and a half in New York. How, how amazing was that? I can tell you stories about like hanging out with people down in the tunnels. And I never tried to be homeless. Um, but I'd get back on the subway, the one train, uh, after spending two weeks down the tunnels, and people would sit beside me because I looked normal. And then after about uh, five seconds, they go, <laughs> <laughs> and then, then it would get wider and wider. The space would get wider and wider and wider around me. I remember going back to the apartment where I lived in at the time, and my wife would make me take off all my clothes in the corridor outside, everything, right? <laughs> I'd be like, oh my god. <laughs> and, and then, because I had to dump them outside and then, then rush in and go, in, go, go into the shower. Um, uh, I liked engaging with that sort of world um, when I went to, to live with the, uh, the Romani people only for two months in Slovakia. Um, it was incredible to me because my gypsy guides, my Romani guides would not actually stay in the camps that I was staying in. And I would, you know, they'd come with me during the day and then, 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 then they'd leave me at night. I'll never forget being in the gypsy camp and, and this woman um, berating her, her um, son um, in the corner. Now I remember growing up in Ireland and my mother saying to me, you better be good or the gypsies are going to come take you away, right? <laughs> And so I asked my guide, I said, what is that woman saying to um, that, that little kid over the corner? She said, you better, be, you better behave yourself or that white man over there is going to take you away. <laughs> I had all sorts of experiences like that. And, and you know, I feel very lucky to be you know, like sort of acutely uh, 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 alive in the world. But I suppose that's the function of, of, of writing and writers is that you have to continually introduce, or any intellectual pursuit, in fact. Any university um, has to provide that sort of um, that sort of space for the mind um, to grow. Luckily, I've been able to go to, to, to all these different places, and I still believe. Um, you know, I don't know what I'd be like. Um, you know, 20 years from now, if I'm still around, if I'll still believe in the same way. I hope I will believe in the same way because I think it's possible um, to believe in that redemption and, and, and that sort of decency. Well, the, the title of the Romani book is Zoli, and the title of the book about the homeless in the subway tunnels is called This Side of Brightness. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you talk about, you know, what a wonderful education that you had growing up and sort of, you called it almost the privilege of otherness. Yeah. How do we extend that privilege and why is it important? 
That's a great question. Um, well, first of all, we have to believe in our education system. I, th I think my wife is a teacher, and she has got so much like like bureaucratic stuff that she has to go through. We got to respect our teachers more. Like you know, I have a lot of time for our military and all that sort of thing, whatever you know. But it, it really bugs me when I go to an airport and I say anybody in military uniform get onto this uh, flight, and you know you 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 can board early. How about saying? Let's get our teachers to go on, uh, go on board. I really believe that. So, uh, and I think we have to have more respect for, 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 for our process. But I think um, also we have, to, um, we have to obviously put more money into it. And, 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 um, but uh, I'm involved with the Narrative 4, an organization that like, um, has these um, stories that are, we get kids together from all parts of the world and they exchange one another's stories. The more we can do that sort of thing, the bigger the lungs of the world we get, the better uh, we, 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 I think will happen to be. But really, at the heart of it, uh, uh, you know, I think we've got to you know, look at our education system and say this is the, the, this is the heart of our democracy. Um, and there are really important things. I talked about this this morning with some of the professors from, from, from the school. Universities in particular, as opposed to high schools and, and elementary schools, are the places where we can specialize to such a degree that you can actually truly, truly affect a change. It's like holding like a, a, a magnifying glass upon a problem and making it burn. Um, there are not other places that can do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. But it's true, but that's what you guys are doing. I mean, you hold a magnifying glass onto a problem and you can burn it up. Um, there are not a whole lot of other places that are not corporate driven uh, that, 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 that can do that. And that's why I think we have to like, be truly uh, sort of ecumenical and agile in our relationship to what's happening in, in our universities and keep those little corners going and, and, and not like pander to the lowest common denominator. Thank you. Sure. Frank McCord. The question is about Frank McCord. So Frank McCord came from down, and 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 sort of I came from 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 up. The truth of the matter is that I, I used to talk to Frank and say, I hate you, Frank. You got all the misery in Ireland and left none for me. I wanted to be miserable. I'm a novelist for crying out loud. I wanted to be miserable. Like. Uh, but I, I would get together with him, and Frank was an enormous, a brilliant teacher and all sorts of things. And I, and, and I had the privilege of having dinner with some people last night, and I told him a story about Frank McCord, um, that when he was dying, the week he was dying, uh, he was a great friend. I loved Frank. Um, and I'd go out, have a few jars with him, and uh, you know, uh, we'd, 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 we'd talk literature and stuff, and we'd go dancing with our wives and stuff. And, 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 and at the end, three days before he died, he wasn't able to speak anymore, but he could write stuff down. And so I wrote down on a piece of paper, Frank, where and when are you going to go dancing now, right? And he took the, a big smile on his face. He took the, he was in his wheelchair. He took it out onto the, 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 the little balcony of the, the, the hospice where he was on 92nd Street and 2nd Avenue, I think it was. And um, it took about 15 minutes. And he got, I got back the reply. I still have it hanging in my office. And he said, so where and when are you going to go dancing now? And he said, every Sabbath. Right? And next Sabbath, I will go dancing upstairs with the great JC and the Mary M and the 12 hot boys. <laughs> and the last thing that I know that Frank ever wrote, he said, and in the morning all will be forgiven. <laughs> Which is, if I ever write about Frank McCord, but there's no need to write about Frank McCord because he wrote so beautifully about himself, I would write a book called, and in the morning all will be forgiven. Uh, he was, a, he, he, he was a, a great character, uh, a great writer, and, um, and he was a great fiction writer. I used to laugh with him. He said, he, he said that he wrote nonfiction. It was a total utter lie. He was writing fiction all the time. 
But for me, there is no difference between fiction and, and, and non-fiction. And I know that gets controversial uh, when some people's imagination, especially when you go to parties and you like, meet men and women, like um, you'll go and like, and you meet, uh, and the guy will say, you shake his hand and you say, um, he'll say, oh, I never read fiction, right? <laughs> uh, I only read non-fiction. And the woman will say, see, there's some people that are laughing. The woman will say, oh, I only read fiction. And, uh, but really, non-fiction and fiction are the same thing. Um, and the only way to, to, to negotiate that, there's a number of ways to negotiate that, but to think about it, um, if you want to think about um, some place that represents itself as uh, uh, presenting non-fiction, but really is fiction, think about watching Fox 5 News. <laughs> but the imagined can be real as well at, this, uh, at, at the same time. We have another, oh, here, hi. In your novel, uh, Let the Great World Spin, you have a moment where there's hackers on a phone with a woman trying to find out about the tightrope walker. Right. What do you see the role of the internet doing in otherness? Oh, wow. This is a great question. What is the role of the internet in, in, in otherness? I will tell you that I think that one of the great gifts to the American people, uh, or to the people of the world, not, um, well, first of all, the American Constitution, but what we don't understand is that back in 68, 67, 68, 69, all the way up until the early 70s, the American um, military was developing the what was called the DARPANET or the ARPANET at that time. Uh, the HTTP tag, the WWW stuff, was actually given out as a, uh, as a more or less free gift. Whether there was something more behind it, um, I don't yet know, but it seems to me that the gift of the internet is one of the most incredible things uh, that has happened uh, to us. We have to be careful with it because it's like language and be careful, because, um, be careful of this mighty weapon because in the wrong hands it can do bad things. Language can do bad things. The internet can, can, can do bad things. Um, but it's here, we have it, we own it, and we have to learn how to, how to shepherd it. And um, I think in certain ways, um, you know, uh, that thing that could have only belonged to the Defense Department, the American Defense Department, back in the late 60s, early 70s, now sort of belongs to uh, everyone. It was very risky for them to do. But it does speak to me about some of the things that I've, I have a complicated relationship, as probably most of us do, with American politics. But, 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 but in, in a lot of ways, there have been some very, very, very good things that have happened uh, to the world. And the internet is, is really one of them. I don't think it's going to destroy books. Um, because the thing is, and we're talking about stories tonight, and, 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 and Monsignor Quinn um, uh, said it so eloquently. Um, you know, there are, there, there, there are a lot of things, uh, you know, about stories um, and, and books and so on. Um, and death can take away a lot of things. Death can take away our country. Death can take away our houses. Death can take away our identity. Death can even take away our family. But death can never take away our stories. Our stories will always live. And there will always be a need for us to tell stories to one another. They can even take books away from me. I don't care. But they will never. It's just impossible. It's uh, logically, philosophically, spiritually impossible to take away um, what stories are for us. So I think that's important. To, um, uh, maybe that's a good place to end for this evening. Right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Say it again. Thank you again for coming, Colm. Even though we did invite you, we do thank you for coming. It's a kind of a funny way we do things. And uh, if you want to see a funny story about uh, Colm, go online and go to uh, Stephen Colbert and put in his name, and you will smile out loud because the stories will make you realize the giftedness of the speaker that we have here tonight. Let me uh, just offer this, and then we'll call upon our provost for closing remarks. But I go back to what we said in the beginning in Colum's own words, in which he concluded with tonight, and that is the power of storytelling. And I love the way you just put it, that death can take away all, but certainly not our stories. And these are your words, I don't know a greater privilege than that of being allowed to tell a story 
or to listen to a story. Our stories are the only thing we have that can trump life itself. Thank you, Thank you for your stories tonight. Thank you so much. The wonderful thing about Colum's stories are that they are, as was pointed out, stories of healing and grace and compassion and mercy and redemption. As Pat Gross pointed out to us, you do truly honor us, Colum, by being here tonight. And as we all stand in awe at your amazing gift and your talents as a master wordsmith, as an outstanding author and an incredible imagination and ability to help others meditate upon the lessons that this world entrusted to us, gives to us. So thank you a thousand times over. It is a great honor for us to be with you tonight. For our closing remarks, we're going to go to our provost. And one of the things I've learned being on another campus is that the most important leader on campus after the president is the provost. Or at least that's what provosts tell me. <laughs> this provost is brand new to the University of Scranton. He comes all the way from Texas. I invite him up now to offer some closing remarks. He's already established a trademark on the commons. You'll see it as he comes up the steps, his cowboy boots, right from Texas. Dr. Donald Boomgarten, provost of the university. I'd like to uh, begin tonight by expressing the gratitude of the university towards all of the wonderful donors that are gathered here tonight that have made this evening possible. Uh, the gift that you have given to the library, but also to the University of Scranton, is so critical to the excellence that we try to reach for at our university. Without you, this would not be possible. And so I want to say thank you to all of you before I say anything else. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Sandra and to Charles, who have worked so hard to put this event together, as well as their committees that have worked with them. Um, I had a personal experience when I first arrived here. One of the very first people I met when I moved into my office was Charles, and he came up and he handed me a copy of Transatlantic. And he said, Don, we're going to have this great evening later in the year, and we're going to have a chance to get to know this author. and." read his works, and discuss ideas. And I thought, I've come to the right university. <laughs> that was not the first conversation I was expecting to have. And so I was thrilled with that. And so there's a culture here at the University of Scranton which is very, very devoted towards the life of the mind and the life of the arts. And you know, as a, as a performing artist, of sorts myself, um, when I started to read Colum's writings, uh, I said, you know, I'm not sure if this is not poetry. Where does the prose begin and the poetry end? I wasn't sure. And I actually thought of Gerald Manley Hopkins as I read it. I was so touched by it. I then, as I read more, and I spoke to others about the work, I realized that there were some alignments between Colum's writings and what we do here at the University of Scranton and what we do at all the great Jesuit universities. The first one is to create a spirit within our students of self-awareness. Who are we? Where are we going? Where have we been? Colum's writings are full of characters that are on that journey. And as readers, we enter into their journey, and we also make our own journey. That is a very powerful gift in his writings, which aligns so beautifully with our core ideals. A second one is the concept of ingenuity. To be a creative artist is to create something out of nothing, to tell a story, to make something up out of thin air, and to refine that into a great work, as our author does, is truly a gift from God. And so he is creating these wonderful works and expressing ideas. And that act of creation is, for each of us, a chance to encounter God. 
and that's another aspect of our great university. There's also found in these works a tremendous sense of heroism, of characters overcoming, of characters being the muscular optimist and not being the cynic. Again and again and again, as Colin was saying tonight about his own personal view of the world, how powerful that is, how much power one optimist can have in a room of cynics is unbelievable. And he demonstrates that in his writings. And then finally, in his writings, we, we find over and over again a sense of love, a sense of compassion, a sense of wanting to connect to others for a greater reason, to connect to others out of love and to transform the world. Also, great ideals that we share at all great Jesuit universities. So as I thank all of you for being here, and I thank especially Colm for, for giving us the gift of his presence, I just call to mind that incredible synergy that we can find in the writings of a great author, the research of a great chemist, the research and writings of a great philosopher, whatever it may be at the university, those four things are paramount. And those are the things that we are inculcating into our students and trying to model ourselves, in our, each in our own failed way. But we're trying so hard to do that. So tonight's celebration of the distinguished author is a manifestation of an even greater thing about the university, and that it's, it's devotion to the greatness of God and to the greatness of the ideals of St. Ignatius. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baumgarten. It's clear to see why people are so happy you're here and why your vision and your energy and your friendly spirit are already making a difference here at the university. Thank you. A last uh, word of thanks to all those who uh, have brought to life the words we so often associate with the University of Scranton, a place of passion, a place of pride, and always a place of promise, promises that uh, somehow come to life because of the goodness of so many like you gathered in this room. I just want to say that uh, sometimes we look around and we forget that there are those who lower the average age in a room like this. <laughs> and I'll ask them to stay on the students from Scranton Prep are here, the students who are part of Mrs. McKenna's creative writing class. If they would stand, we can thank them for being with us. I'd ask they stand, I'd ask the university students, undergrads and graduate students to stand who are here all of whom give life to this university and the reason why we have events like this tonight. And all of whom give rise to the truthfulness of the words that uh, our uh, gifted speaker gave us tonight, talking about the decency of this community, talking about the sense of community, of the sense of connectedness. Our uh, awardee tonight is very humble. He didn't tell you how long that bicycle tour took. Uh, and 12,000 miles across the country, back and forth, up and down. When he does his work, he does his homework, as was pointed out tonight. If it's Stan, I'm going to close with one story to leave you with a smile as you go out. So stand up. I'm only to make sure you're still awake. <laughs> but this is a story that connects Scranton and New York through a figure who once was our bishop for all of eight months, and then went to New York to be the Archbishop, Cardinal John O'Connor. And I only heard this story recently. I thought I had heard all of the Scranton, New York stories. But Cardinal O'Connor went to an event like this. And the master of ceremonies that night had a great difficulty getting all the names straight. And every time he would come to introduce someone, he would say, and now please welcome our next speaker, who is the chairman of our advancement committee, who has done a great job. Please welcome Donald Whalen. And then Donald will be welcome. And then he got through and he said, we should give thanks to the two co-chairs of this dinner who did an extraordinary job. Please help me thank them, the two, uh, Barbara Brown and Susan O'Hara. And he went on this way all the way through the program. They finally got to introduce Cardinal Conner and everybody thought, yikes. <laughs> will he know his name? Well, he did. He introduced him appropriately. And Cardinal Conner then gave the closing prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He went down, Lord, we give you thanks. We ask your blessings upon. We are grateful for, we're appreciative of, 
And we ask all of this through, through <laughs> Christ our Lord, amen. <laughs> Tell all the stories you can. It's what brings light to life. Thank you, Colin, again. Thank you for the joy of being home with all of you. God bless our university.